That's our day. Hello, Zach. Hello, Carla. Is Hi, such how are you guys? <laughs> So this is a, this is a first for us. You're actually, uh, you know, we've streamed to our Facebook and YouTube, but you, this is a very first time we're going to be streaming to Amazon Live. So you are our very first person. Wow, exciting, right? that's exciting. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Well, thank you so much for being here with us today. We're so grateful that you're, uh, you're joined in and your, your book is, I, I can't wait to talk about it because I really think it's, um, it's going to change the conversation in Tolkien studies. And so I'm so excited for, you know, these people out here who maybe haven't read your book yet to have the opportunity to learn more about, well, why they should. <laughs> oh, well, thanks. But I, I have to say first, I have shout out for an unexpected journal because I mean, honestly, I'm just, I'm just bowled over by this, by this whole thing. And by, by seeing this issue, you know, for me, <laughs> um, and I have to say, I think I can speak for a lot of teachers out there that the best possible gift you can give a teacher, you know, like myself is to see students picking up what we teach you and then using it to do these great things. So, I mean, this is a, the best Christmas present ever to see all the work that you are doing, that you're taking these things that we've taught you at HPU, that you're taking from my work and carrying it forward to do things with it. I mean, that is just, it's fantastic. So keep it up. And I, I encourage the viewers, you know, subscribe to this journal. You you won't regret it. You'll be glad. Thank you so much. That's so nice. And yeah, we'd love to do it. We're so, uh, yeah, we're so grateful to have the opportunity and the platform to share. Um, yeah, I, I'm really interested in maybe the first question uh, that might be great for people to understand is in the interview that we had in this issue uh, with you, you mentioned that intellectual curiosity was basically the foundation for why you wrote your book, Tolkien's Modern Reading. And I guess the question is, why, why weren't the answers available that you were looking for? Like, why is the medieval picture of Tolkien that maybe he didn't read modern sources. Why is that so dominant if, as I would say you've argued successfully, if that's inaccurate? That's such an interesting question, Zach. And it's a complex one. And in fact, that that question added a couple of years, literally, onto the writing of this book as I <laughs> had to wrestle with it. And I think there's a couple of factors involved. Um, the sort of the clearest is that his biographer Humphrey Carpenter, who wrote the you know the, the full authorized biography, you know, and, and had such significant influence in later biographers, simply states outright um, that he had no interest in modern literature, that he didn't read it, that he took no notice of it, uh, and so it's perfectly logical that that people took that as accurate. I mean, he's the authorized biographer, right? Now it turns out that I discovered that Carpenter himself did not even try for objectivity. He had issues with Tolkien. He had he had just a strange view on what constitutes biography. He even wrote, he even said in an interview that he thought most biographies were really about the biographer. Well, that's interesting, um, but it doesn't help us understand Tolkien. So that's, that's part of it. But I think there's a couple other factors in there as well. One of them is that since Tolkien worked in medieval literature for his, his profession, and that's what he wrote about professionally, there's kind of a, a presupposition that that would be his, his main interest. And that's accurate in that that was his professional interest. I mean, he was an expert on Beowulf, on ancient languages. Um, this is what he did and he was deeply interested in it and it had a huge influence on his work. And that's absolutely correct. But since that's the most visible part and what he was reading privately isn't as visible, people, tended to see more the medieval part, I think, primarily. And that's natural enough. Um, and I think a third factor, interestingly, is that people, even in Tolkien's lifetime, almost wanted him to be kind of nostalgic and backward looking. And it's quite telling that there was an interview that he did, um, you know, during, obviously during his lifetime, he's talking with this interviewer who basically tries to lead him into saying that he, that he doesn't read the newspapers and doesn't care about modern day events. And Tolkien says, oh no, oh no, I, I subscribe to three newspapers. And he says very emphatically that he's interested in local news and national news and international news. And I found that he was in fact very up to date in international news. 
But I think it's interesting that even in his lifetime, people just wanted to put him in that medieval nostalgic sort of pigeonhole. And I, my thinking in this is that he's just sort of easier to domesticate if you put him in that little category. Mm -hmm. And if you see that he really is engaging with the themes and issues of modernity, the kinds of issues that he raises about power, about, you know, domination, about totalitarianism, you know, about the environment, they're much more challenging and prophetic if we see him as someone who's engaging with the modern world, drawing on the medieval world. And that's scary. And I think people have wanted, even in his day, and no, no, he's he's just this cute little medievalist. Let's leave him be. <laughs> so in your interview in with an unexpected journal, you mentioned uh, Tolkien read many female authors, and he also wrote many strong female characters. And that maybe wasn't as common in his day as it might be today. Uh, did you un uncover anything uh, where this syringe originated from? Uh, like why he had uh, more readily accepted his female colleagues? Yeah, I mean, that's that's an interesting question again. Um, and one that I, you know, have only just started sort of investigating. But I think we can see some kind of positive influences very early on. I mean, he had um, a remarkable mother. Mabel Tolkien um, was highly intelligent, highly educated, was you know educating him at home in languages and literature. Uh, and she was obviously very strong-minded. She converted to Catholicism um, and he followed her example. So from his earliest days, he had a very robust um, female role model whom he loved and admired. It's also interesting to note that he met his future wife, Edith, when he was just 16. Um, and she was also a very strong woman. She was an orphan. Um, she was you know, making her way in the world. And she ended up becoming what Tolkien would say was his, his Luthien to, to him. And if you know the story of the Silmarillion, Luthien is an amazing character. She actually rescues the male character Baron in the story of Baron and Luthien. You know, she, <laughs> she is one tough, robust, strong character. So I think uh -huh. he had, a, had an important role in that. Um, and so, and then in his English faculty work, he got to know other um, female colleagues whom he became friends with and, and mm -hmm. admired. And I just think he had, a, he had a good start to begin with. And I want to name one other important um, influence, I think, in his positive interaction with women. And that's that he always had a very strong personal devotion to the Virgin Mary. Um, you know, as a Catholic, this is part of his, his devotional life. But he had a particular emphasis on admiring Mary. He even says, um, describes her as the person upon whom all my own small perception of beauty, both in majesty and simplicity is founded. I mean, that's a pretty robust statement. So here we see integrated with his faith, this deep respect and admiration for Mary, the mother of God. And I think that also weaves into his positive personal um, experiences to give him a really strong foundation to respect admire and to work alongside women awesome wow. yeah i i love that and it's so it's so interesting because what you're one thing that your book really it, well and your work really in general has centered around is the role of the imagination um and your new book obviously shows that tolton's imagination was influenced by maybe some sources that we might not expect like you said, he's a lot easier to uh, to wrestle with if we make him a, a cute little medieval kind of figure from the past. Um, but why is the imagination, I mean, I guess we can answer this broadly or in the context of your work, however you want to do it, but why is the imagination such a critical issue for apologists today? I mean, Carla, you spoke to that in the lead-in, but Dr. Ordway, mm -hmm. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that too. Well, this is really the cent this this whole question is at the really center of my apologetics work. So I got my literary critical work with Tolkien. I got my apologetics work, and this question of the imagination is really central to that because I would argue that the the main underlying issue, the number one issue when we're addressing how do we talk about the faith, how do we share the faith, is actually this question of meaning because we can use words like resurrection or prayer or sin or grace. And 
I think for a lot of people, I mean, including my former self, you know, because I'm a convert, these words don't really mean much of anything or they or they mean something trivial or, or distorted. And so when we're talking about the faith, when we're talking about Jesus, when we're talking about what we believe, a lot of times we're just talking past each other because the words don't have any real meaning. And this is a relatively new and major shift because up till I'm gonna say middle of the 20th century, even in cultures that had largely become secularized, there was a lot of cultural capital. So we were kind of coasting culturally. You could assume people had the right meanings, even if they chose not to act on them or chose to reject what they what they meant. But now that's not the case. Um, and so we need to we need to be developing meaning. Um, and that's where the imagination comes into play, because the imagination is the meaning making faculty. Our, our intellect, our reason is what makes judgments. Our senses are what give us images of, of what we see. But our imagination is the faculty that forms those images, those memories, those thoughts into images that we can then actually make a judgment about so that it, so that it makes something robust that we can think about. And I think that's something that Tolkien does very well. You know, he does it very subtly. You know, the Lord of the Rings is not an allegory. Um, he's, he's not making a gospel tract. Um, but he is infusing it with his faith because he, you know, he believes it. It's infusing everything that he's doing. And so we see in, for instance, the figure of Frodo, a very meaningful image of Christian self-sacrifice. We see an image of Christ. Um, we see that in Sam. We see it in Aragorn, a figure of the of Christ as king. We see in Gandalf, a figure you know, of Christ as as like a you know a prophet. Well, I, I believe there's an issue. There's an article in this issue about that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so I, we see the way that Tolkien is a master at creating meaning with um with this imagination, with with the with his stories. And so you can read the Lord of the Rings and have a sense of what it means to be um, self-sacrificial about what the image of Christ really is. That's actually robust and, and real. And so then you might actually turn to the Gospels and, and kind of take them more seriously than you might otherwise have done. If the only thing you know about you know Christ is like, oh, it's on those billboards about keep Christ in Christmas, like you know, yeah, whatever. <laughs> you actually have a robust picture and you're and therefore this is the key thing you're interested you're, you're going to want to know more who is, who is this jesus called christ and that i think is the main and foundational role of the imagination in, in apologetics so i just want to say you you mentioned in your last comment that you were a convert so you actually wrote a book about this, about your coming to faith, and the title of that book is Not God's Type, An Academic Atheist Lays Down Our Arms. Uh, if you look at the, the cover of our book, that actually, the Virginia, actually, our designer uh, in, integrated, so that's the difference. The other thing that she's been talking about in this last is also in another book that she wrote about imaginative apologetics and that is called apologetics and christian imagination and i'm sorry i forgot what the subtitle was but anyway so everything that she's been saying here now that's in those yeah, it's in those two books okay so um now a lot of us from Houston Baptist like to talk about C.S. Lewis and J.R. Tolkien. Do you have any other recommendations of authors who are doing some similar kinds of imaginative apologetics? Um, I don't have a lot of recommendations. I always I, I sort, of, sort of brace myself when I get this question because part of the problem is that we don't have nearly enough. Um, now, there are other authors out there doing, doing great things. Um, there's none that has had the, the massive impact, I think, that Tolkien and Lewis has had. Um, um, but I think one one figure that I might note straight away um, is Malcolm Geit. Um, he's an Anglican poet, and he's doing a tremendous amount um, to kind of revive this idea of the imagination. And indeed, um, Malcolm's book, Faith, Hope, and Poetry, was really the book that directly inspired me to take up the work of imaginative apologetics. So you have kind of a genealogy, right? You know, from Malcolm to me to you. Mm -hmm. 
And I think one of the most notable about um, Malcolm Geith's work is that it's becoming widely popular. He's not just writing for a niche audience, which is the case for a lot of Christian authors. Um, he's actually reaching a really wide audience with, with poetry books that are, are actually becoming bestsellers. I mean, poetry is, this is remarkable these days. Yeah, yeah. To, to look at um, in terms of his work. Yeah, the, the, in one of the later sessions, they actually uh, one of someone mentions that that kind of that book helped them uh, appreciate poetry because I think a lot of us have uh, I don't know we have challenges. I don't know why that is. Why we have challenges with poetry when historically that's been the main type of of literature, right, is this verbal poetry and song and poem, but we, we don't seem to be able to, we have problems with it. Well, I think that's because it, it hasn't been taught. I mean, I, I know that when I was in, you know, in school, a lot of what we got for poetry was, you know, you had to dissect it, but you didn't enjoy it. And I think we've somewhat lost mm -hmm. this idea of, it's okay, you can read a poem and just like it. That's allowed. You have permission. Officially, all audience, you have permission to just like poems. I give you that permission officially. You got it from me. <laughs> and I also think that the modern modern free verse poetry has taken over kind of critically for the last few decades. Um, and that has its value and it's done well, but it doesn't have the widespread appeal that poetry with traditional verse forms does with rhyme, with rhythm, with structure, with narrative. Um, these are the verse mm -hmm. forms that have lasted for millennia and for good reason. And I think part of the reason a lot of people today don't like poetry, don't think they like poetry, is that first, they've never been taught how to read it. And second, the only poetry they've been given has been really kind of modernist, almost experimental stuff. And they think, I, I don't care for this. Therefore, I don't like poetry. But no, you just don't like that kind of poetry. So that's what yeah. I like about Malcolm Wright's poetry is it's using traditional verse forms. You can read it, you can enjoy it, it sounds great. And this, and as a poet myself, this is the kind of form that I try to work in. I write sonnets, I write Tours of Rima, um, because I think, you know, using, you know, forms that are accessible and engaging um, to the reader matters. Like, I want people to actually enjoy the poetry that I write. You know, this this ought not to be rocket science. Um, <laughs> so I, I <laughs> sort of encourage the poets, it's okay, write stuff people like, this is good. So we didn't send her this question to her ahead of time, but I, I have this question, so I'm going to ask her anyway. So, um, I have, I did not take your creative writing class at HBU, and I am really regretting that I didn't do that because I see all the amazing, amazing work that people who took it have done, and almost all of them say, yeah, I didn't think I was, you know, a creative writer. I didn't, I didn't like poetry ahead of time. So, but we have, I mean, if you look at the the issues of the journal, uh, we almost always we always have poetry because Donald Ketching always submits at least something to a, a poem there. But what's your secret? What is your secret to getting that, like helping people discover something that they didn't know they have? Well, well, this is a, this is an interesting question. What's my secret? Um, I think probably I would say first of all, just the recognition that to write creatively is hard work. You know, it's not just a question of inspiration. And anybody who's had one of my um, classes that teaches academic writing has the same experience. But creative writing is not really any different in that sense. I think a lot of people have this mistaken idea that if I'm gonna be a poet, I need to be able to just have a moment of inspiration and dash off this poem, or I'm gonna write a novel, I need to be fired with inspiration. I just sit down and it flows from my pen. Well, this is rubbish. Mm -hmm. It's nonsense, it's not people write. Well, I mean, maybe there's somebody who writes like that, but I've never met them, um, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> and I think this idea, uh, and this is something that I work with at the Word on Fire Institute, which is uh, where I work full time now. Um, I'm doing um, writing groups within the Institute and you know, fostering creative writing. Mm -hmm. And so doing seminars, so I'm now teaching creative writing in that venue. And I've been taking the same approach, which is to say, you need to take a piece of creative writing through that same process, idea generation, drafting, revision, feedback. All of my students in the audience are always saying, yeah, this, this is familiar, right? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so it's not in that sense different. And I think that that simple step that you don't have to expect to be able to dash off 
something in a, in a white heat of inspiration to have it be brilliant. If you can get past that false expectation, all of a sudden it opens up realms of possibility. Your first draft of the story might be terrible. This is okay. Mm -hmm. Your first draft of the essay is going to be terrible. The story's not going to be any different. And I think that recognition, just roll up your sleeves and get to it. And also learn the craft. If you're going to write poetry, learn how rhyme works. Learn how meter works. Learn the verse forms. If you're writing fiction, know the genre, know the form, know about pacing and structure and characterization. It's hard work, very hard work. Um, and once you accept that as well, it's like, okay, I'm not going to be amazing instantly. I'm going to work at it. So that's kind of the, the, the summing up of my general approach to teaching creative writing. You know, I've had those times, I, moments where it just flows and I just don't even have to think about it. And I think that's almost uh, an obstacle sometimes because then you're always waiting for that experience of writing. And then you think that if you're not in that state or that flow that you're, it's not going to be good or you can't write or whatever. And so I, that took me a while to get out of that. <laughs> but at, at least for me too, it's really encouraging to to look back at Tolkien and realize that he, yeah, he revised a lot, and he had a lot of uh, help with his, uh, you know, peer editors, shall we say. The inklings were very um, sometimes strong in their criticism, I, I believe, on Tolkien's work, and so yeah, it, it, it's encouraging to me that. It, yeah, he needed his friends to help him. And sometimes, you know, I, I need help too. And I'm entirely, um, I, I appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, we really need this community of writers. I mean, one of the things in Tolkien's Modern Reading that I am most delighted in was writing the acknowledgements. I mean, it's a page and a half of really dense print because I had so many people to thank um, in the work of this, in this book. I mean, obviously, I'm the one who wrote it, but it wasn't a solo endeavor in the sense of me just all isolated. All these people helped, and you know, many people you know, you know gave comments and, and feedback and 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 help on it. And I think that's really important. And of course, if we look at Tolkien as an example of somebody who did a lot of revising. We also have to bear in mind that he he could be too much a perfectionist and had to have basically the manuscript pried out of his hands. You know, like and sent to the sent to the publisher, uh, because eventually you have to let it go. Um, and I have to admit, I gained some sympathy with Tolkien because I spent ten years working on Tolkien's moderating, <laughs> and I I literally was doing last edits to the proofs thirty minutes before I had to go to the printers. Um, and <laughs> so I, I kid you not, and I sympathize with him. But at some point, you've got to say, I have given it everything I can, which I did, and now it has to go out into the world. Uh, so there's that, there's that, <laughs> that balance as well. That well, sounds like the journal. We have yeah. very short publishing timelines, which we are trying to work on, but I, that was one of the things when I, I did take um, another writing class from Dr. Ordway and she assigns Bandersnatch by Diana, Gl uh, Diana Glyer and, and talks about that creative community, um, that the Inklings had, which uh, Tolkien was a part of. Uh, we do have, she's not uh, going to be with us today, but we do have a an essay by Jamie Porterwood that talks about, you know, the impact of understanding that was in community. But when I was reading, I think it was that book um, where he, she provides a, a clip of uh, some of Tolkien's early, like early it, it rendition. And I'm thinking, okay, that really isn't that good. And so that makes me feel better because maybe there's hope for me. <laughs> like, like the thing that was included, it was like really rough, really rough. Uh, well, you, know, you, you mentioned your book going out into the world and uh, I mean, your thesis is a little bit provocative. I mean, but it challenges the conventional wisdom that so many have accepted for so long. So how How's the reception been to Tolkien's modern reading? Have you gotten a lot of like pushback, for lack of a better word? Well, I've been really pleased with the reception. Um, I think overall, people have have seen, you know, that this is that this is something useful and something good. Um, I mean, I, I made my best effort to document everything to the nth degree. 
Um, and there's thousands of footnotes and endnotes, literally. Um, and I think that helps because I'm not I'm not just making this stuff up. I, you can trace everything, you know, to to the evidence. So I think I'm very grateful. It's been very very well received. Um, the, there's the only kind of pushback I've gotten a little bit is um, some folks saying I'm a little too tough on Humphrey Carpenter. Um, and for that, I would say, well, I think he deserves everything I said in the book, but mostly what I do in the book is I present what Carpenter himself said about Tolkien and the Inklings. And I show where Carpenter was simply incorrect in the things that he says. And I think the reader can draw their own conclusions about whether um, Carpenter, you know, made some made some missteps or not. Um, and the other, the other slight pushback I've gotten again. This, this has been not much. Um, is people saying, "Well, you know, this this isn't new. We knew that Tolkien read these modern things before." And I think this is an interesting point because in Tolkien's scholarship, it's absolutely correct that there have been authors, critics who did know um, about many, not all, but many of the modern works that I mentioned. And I quote from them and I cite them in the book. Um, but nothing had been put together. There wasn't a systematic picture. So you had one scholar here, one scholar there mentioning this modern work or that modern work, but all of them treating it more or less as an exception to the rule. And, but when you pile up all the exceptions, you realize this isn't about exceptions. There is no rule. <laughs> <laughs> and also, you know, even though in the scholarly community, there was already a recognition that he wasn't just a medievalist. If you look at the wider world, because the Tolkien's readership is massive, just look at what goes out in the media and you'll see an absolute stereotype of him as a nostalgic, tweety, stuck in the past, old fuddy-duddy. Memes, jokes, videos, everything. There's, and, and even, you know, people who should know better, journalists, you know, writing articles in newspapers about Tolkien, they just default to saying that, of course, he hated the modern world. Of course, he hated technology because that's what everybody knows. Right. So out there in the wider world, there, there's absolutely a pervasive sense of him as being stuck in the past. And that's a, a different question than what Tolkien specialists um, knew. And so what I'm hoping is that this book will help to bridge, start to bridge that gap. Because I know that a lot of the readers of Tolkien's modern reading are people who are part of that wider readership. And just no one has told them. No one has told them, look, he wasn't like that. He was actually much more complex, much more interesting, much more well read. Um, and so it really has been an eye opener for kind of the average Tolkien reader. Uh, and and I'm, I'm delighted. And I have to say, you know, those, those pushbacks have been very, very slight. I'm quite grateful, really grateful for the way that, that it has been I think very well received, um, broadly speaking. That's awesome to hear. And it is funny. I, uh, I've been teaching a class on Tolkien to some high school students. And it, it is funny how, you know, that, that picture does seem to be influential even, and they're very well read. They're, they've read Tolkien themselves. They're very knowledgeable for high school students. And that was handed the picture that they had been given. So I was very grateful to written this book because I had, I didn't assign it and I didn't know where to read go down that road, but I'm like, oh, I have a recommendation for you guys. Um, it's important. So one of my, um, my favorite parts of the book is that you, your discussion about um, what Tolkien called the leaf mold, like the impact of all the influences. Uh, and just as a as a note, if you get Tolkien's modern reading, she has in the back she has a, a di chart basically of everything she researched that he read, uh, whether he read it, uh, like his how she verified it, his notes. Um, yeah, it's it's pretty it's pretty impressive. And the book itself is is a really like this, this is something you could give as a gift and be not think that you were giving a cheap gift. It has. Uh, it's a beautiful cover. It has uh, pictures on the inside. It's really nice. The paper is really nice. It's just a, uh, a nicely produced book too. But can you talk a little bit about the, the leaf mold? Oh, well, this, I mean, this is just the way that his creative imagination worked. Um, and I think that's one of the things that I would suggest as a, as a kind of takeaway um, for readers of this book, because, you know, 
obviously it's of interest to scholars that you know that he read all these different things. And I've I've pulled up a lot of things people just didn't know about this. In this picture of Tolkien as someone who really was engaged with the modern world is a, I think a. a a big shift in our understanding. It's a, it's making our picture of him much more well-rounded because um, mm -hmm. those other parts are still true and accurate. He, he really was a medievalist. He loved the past. That's, that's absolutely true. We're adding another angle here. But I think what's interesting about the leaf mold comment is the way that it shows he had, a, a, I think, a, a good insight into his own creative process. He read all these things, ancient literature, medieval literature, modern literature, and it was like the leaves that fall onto the forest floor and they eventually break down into mulch and become part of the soil, put nutrients in the soil and they're taken up into the tree. Well, Tolkien had mm -hmm. this image of the tree of tales that he was contributing to. How is this tree of tales nourished by all that he has thought and seen and experienced and all that he has read? So all of these things provide part of this sort of nutrient mulch that his tree is, is rooted in. And that's, I think, really important in understanding the impact of his work. Because one of the questions that you know prompted me in this whole endeavor was trying to understand how is it that this book can speak so powerfully to the modern day? If it's mm -hmm. it's fantasy, it's you know, if it's it's drawing, obviously drawing on medieval literature, you know, Beowulf and other texts. But if that's it, how can it speak so powerfully to the issues of today, which it does? And I think the answer is that his his own leaf mulch was composed of a great variety of different things. He had a lot of different experiences, a lot of different friendships, and he read really much, much more widely than we have thought until now. And I think that is a really key insight to understanding his creative imagination. And therefore, I think to understand his work with a, with a fresh way to see it kind of more three-dimensionally an, an extra angle than, than we did before. Mm -hmm. Well, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Holly, for joining us. We just uh, thank you for, we just, you just, we just love you. We just are so happy to see you off in publishing. And I know that people at HBU miss you, but we're just, um, I guess it's just time for the rest of the world to have a little bit more of Holly Ordway. <laughs> but again, she has a website, hollyordway.com, uh, that you can go and visit her work. And her book, her most recent book is Tolkien's Modern Reading. I highly uh, recommend that you pick that up. But her other two books that you should also read that are also very helpful are uh, Not God's Type, which is her spiritual autobiography, and also uh, apologetics for the Christian imagination. It'd be awesome to see that book hit the top of the apologetics chart on Amazon. So anyway, we are going to go now into another session with one of uh, Holly Ordway's former colleagues at Houston Baptist University, uh, Dr. Michael Ward and Zach. So we will say goodbye to you and we will see you next time. Thank right, you, Holly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.